All right, everybody, welcome back to the Street Parking Podcast. Today is going to be, I think, probably one of our more popular episodes ever because I've got with me E.C. Sinkowski of the 800 gram challenge or optimize me nutrition. How do you define yourself? Like, yeah, that worked. What are you perfect. of? <laughs> no, that's perfect. Yeah. Optimize me nutrition, but most people know the 800 gram challenge. More. Okay. And she's here with us um, this week filming a bunch of material that is going to be coming and available to the street parking community soon. I don't know when this podcast will come out. <laughs> um, so I always kind of record it, not knowing what we're leading into, but that's what she's here doing with us this week. We're super excited to, add another just amazing coach to our like collaborative efforts that we've been doing recently. And um, so this podcast is kind of to get to know her and uh, why we trust her (laughs) 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 and why we're um, wanting to collaborate with her, but then also like kind of what her belief system is around nutrition and how that came to be. Yes. And I think it's pretty cool because I've known EC uh, I would guess what, like 2008, 2009. Yeah, I think so. I got onto the CrossFit seminar staff in 2008, and you were already doing it. When did mm-hmm. you join? Technically 2006, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I would say that EC is one of three women that when I got onto the seminar team was I viewed as very much like a mentor to me. Um, Nicole Carroll, EC, and Lisa Ray were like the three, like, oh man, they're just killing it. They're so smart. Um, they they do such a great job and I want to aspire to be like them. She was definitely one of those people for me. We got to work together, not as much as I worked with other people cause she was more East coast and I was mm-hmm. on the West coast, but we did work together enough, <laughs> um, to get to know each other well. And then obviously we're around each other the, during the competitive season, uh, mm-hmm. and, and that sort of thing too. Yes. <laughs> so, um, EC was known in the, on the seminar team as just the, the person, the go-to mind when it came to nutrition stuff. Mm-hmm. How did that come to be like what is your background and how did you become that on the nutrition team and then we'll we'll get into where it went after that as well yeah yeah I don't really know how that came to be myself I know I was super interested in nutrition and I was interested in all the different trends and one of the people that I looked up to when I first got on staff was Rob Wolf he was still doing nutrition at that time um, but I did have a background in biochem engineering and a, and a master's that had some, as you do, <laughs> a first, <laughs> as you do, a first master's that also had some genetic biological components. So I certainly was interested in the science end of things. And then to get to CrossFit and feel like everything you thought you knew was wrong. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to know more about this. So certainly CrossFit sparked my interest to learn more about nutrition, um, and so I guess that's how it kind of came to be because I would kind of follow all the different things of what you're supposed to do and, and not. What were you doing like career wise? Um, and what was your belief around nutrition before CrossFit? Mm, yeah, I was actually in environmental consulting. Okay. <laughs> so highly not related. Okay. Um, not doing much with nutrition at all, but very active, always very active. And I don't know that I had any belief system, probably if anything, a little bit low fat. Okay. Um, As most people did. Right. And probably a little bit more endurance, although I definitely did more strength than I think a lot of traditional splits. So I don't think I thought about it that much. Like I knew soda wasn't something I should have all the time and I didn't, but it certainly wasn't any sort of looking at macros or counting or that type of stuff. Yeah. I feel like there was a group of us, and this might still be true. I just don't know where, um, when we got into CrossFit, I would say between the years of whatever, 2002 and maybe 2012, like a decade where I mean, I would have read any book that was suggested to me. I was so hungry for like learning and knowledge and like figuring it out and and truly understanding Mm -hmm. stuff as opposed to just like, oh, well, this is what they say to do, so I'm going to do it. And I don't know if that's still true, but I think that there was a group of us that that was like, we were reading all of the books, The Zone, The Protein Power Life Plan, The Paleo, The Paleo for Athletes, like (laughs) any of the books we would have taken in and um, good carbs, bad carbs, you're just like, trying to keep your eyes open and you still do this actually (laughs) and reading, you know, anything. Um, so is that kind of what happened? And because you had an understanding of science, you were probably able to 
absorb it a lot better than even the rest of us? I thought so. I mean, I think, as you know, I went down a couple rabbit holes. So whether or not I really understood, it's a good question. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, I liked the fact that people were now talking about nutrition from a more scientific point of view. And I thought that my background was helping with that. But certainly, yeah, every of those trends and all of those diet books, I was right there. And I agree with you that there was this time period when everyone was doing that for sure. I think it's a little bit still true now. And the trends are just slightly different or slightly different named. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay. So when you dove in, when you jumped cause I do want to talk about one of the things, one of the reasons that I, um, look up to you so much and why I think your content is so relatable and you're able to simplify it is because you have gone down so many rabbit holes. <laughs> like I've seen it happen. Um, yeah. and I can remember a few of them, oh, but yeah. when you first joined, uh, or when you first started CrossFit and you got into the nutrition stuff, did you jump to zone? Mm-hmm. Cause that was really big back then. Or did you jump to the paleo train yeah. first? Cause they, those two were kind of like the two that you, cho- people were like choosing a side. Yeah. I went zone or tried to, I should say now, as you remember, some of the zone block prescriptions were a little low aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> I was like wasting away. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the upper end for women that they had recommended was 14 blocks. And yes. you know, I think I was on like 11. Right. You, you were lower, of course. Um, and what people don't often see on a podcast sitting down like this is I'm six feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm taller than a lot of men. Yes. <laughs> and so 14 blocks, like I just could not figure out how that was supposed to work. I tried, and then my cheat days were like these just epic you know, way more than a cheap meal type of thing. And so it never really worked for me. I think it would have if I had just understood that that caloric amount was... Not to look at the gender right. part of it and <laughs> right. just eat your body, body size. size. And understand like total intake. But of course I didn't. So zone didn't really, quote, work for me. Um, and so I definitely went more hardcore into paleo because it was something I could do. And then, a, you know, thought that I needed to be that strict with it. Oh, yeah, for sure. That was more of my, my jam for the early years. Okay, so you went paleo, and that's where maybe some of the rabbit holes that I remember, because there was paleo, and then there was like EC pulling um, yeah. cherry tomatoes <laughs> off of her Gotta salad because they were just yeah. inflammatory. Inflammatory, <laughs> totally. And I was just like, am I like extremely unhealthy, or is easy C <laughs> losing her mind? Um, the latter. So what are some of the other, okay, so there's the zone thing, there's yeah. the paleo thing. What are some of the other uh, rabbit holes, without explaining it in too sure. much detail? So Because I think it's cool for people to know, because everybody's done it yes. to some extent, whether it's, I, did, I used to do fasting all the time, or I was like the cleanse, or like whatever, you know, people do. I think it's cool to hear that their trusted resource has also... Them. been caught up in some of that some <laughs> same stuff oh yeah i mean definitely zone them paleo then probably paleo with intermittent fasting but wasn't so intermittent i remember that yeah, part too didn't, actually didn't do the intermittent part did it well, every day okay so what were you doing during the <laughs> just those overnight fasts of 15 to like this. 17 hours but i pretty much did it most days if if not all of the days when you were doing this was it more an experiment or was it more i actually believe the science and I think it's going to be great. Like going into it, I have this belief, or it's like going into it, I'm trying to see what happens. I think it was more that I thought it was the the superior method of achieving this optimal health. Okay. And this is, I mean, it's so clear now when people hear this, probably why I talk about the things I do in my podcast, because I did it all and I believed all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I believed the science was going to lead to, I don't know, X more years of my life by fasting or whatever it was, right? So I always thought I was founding the next new thing that was going to like bring me to the supreme state of wellness like this. <laughs> um, the, the issue was I never had a transformational experience on any diet. Right. I was never looking to necessarily lose that much weight. I guess everybody wants to lean out at some degree in their CrossFit career, but I never had like these big goals. So I never experienced a, a big transformational experience. So no diet really sold me. Hmm. which actually now is a strength for what I want to do now. I'm glad that I didn't have a transformational experience with fasting because I think that's why then people are like, everybody needs to do fasting. You know, mm-hmm, they have mm-hmm. a transformational experience. So yeah, I did that for a while. I then did macros for a while, but they were pretty aggressive, I think, on the protein side. Um, I also like to admit, just to add to the realism, I did the potato hack diet. Everybody does. What's that? <laughs> What's the pota- I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh man, this one was definitely like, oh, I just want to do it. But uh you only eat potatoes, boiled potatoes. For how long <laughs> did you do this? It's known as kind of a crash diet. I did it for, I think, three days, but typically, oh, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I um, thought you were going to say three months or something like that. No, not that crazy. So the Great I, Depression <laughs> diet? 
Jeez. I got caught up in things like that as okay, well. Okay, so um, when when you would do something like that, did you have a specific goal that time? or That one was certainly more of like, this is crazy, let's just see. Okay, okay. Um, but definitely all the other ones, in when fasting, macros, it was like, no, no, this is the optimal way to be. No, this is the, okay, don't, and then like you said, it was paleo, but then there was also like paleo adjacent, which was just like a more strict paleo, mm-hmm. right? Almost like a, a Whole30 type of paleo or something mm-hmm. like that. And so... Definitely did all of those more from the standpoint of as I think I thought I was going to have a transformational experience. Was the potato one the weirdest one? Yeah. Yeah, that was up there with weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, how would you determine then when you're, when you're doing one of these things that you didn't want to do it anymore? I think I just didn't, couldn't keep it up. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you just realize it doesn't actually last or you're going out to all of these places. And, you know, I would even travel during my seminar days with balsamic vinegar packets that were the low number of ounces because I was afraid of using the oils at restaurants for dressing. So I would just bring my vinegar packets as my dressing. Um, And it just becomes unsustainable. You all of a sudden get caught in a restaurant without your dressing. (laughs) Or you're like, you're What are you going to do? You're trying to fast every day. What do you mean you don't have potatoes? I know. (laughs) Or you're fasting every day and you realize that you have family brunch or a holiday and you're like, these rules just don't seem to keep holding up. And so ultimately, we would just realize that, like, it didn't, I couldn't sustain it. Would you, okay, so I, one of, this is like more of like a social media question where, you, you know, you can only fit so much in a caption or a right. video. I mean, you understand this more than anyone. <laughs> I feel like if people were to hear your story, the, some of the comments would end up being like, you have an eating disorder or right. blah, blah, blah. Do, I mean, would you categorize any of that stuff as like, I had like control issues with my food yeah. or it was like, how would you categorize? Yeah. I certainly that. would say it was disordered eating. I wouldn't say it's an eating disorder because I think that really starts to, I mean, affect health in very obvious ways. But disordered eating, like what do, you know, afraid to eat this, um, mm-hmm. going to my parents' house. And it wasn't a feeling, cupboards. like you were trying to do it and trying to do it right, but you would not never like have an anxiety attack yeah. if you lost your balsamic pack. Right, right, totally. Okay. Like I would make it work and I would, I would not want to do it, but it would, you know, whatever. There's I'd a difference in the reaction like to yeah. it. Maybe. Yeah, and also just my body wasn't changing in a really negatively unhealthy way, right? I wasn't losing a ton of weight or under eating calories or something like that. So that's why I put it more in disordered eating, but certainly a lot of neuroses about food and and worried about like, oh my gosh, is this food going to harm me? Hmm. Um, You know, nightshades, is this gonna harm me? (laughs) Seed oils, or you know, we we called them vegetable oils and worried about them then and all that stuff. So definitely neurotic, yeah. Yeah, because there's (laughs) kind of like, um, I mean, we used to joke about like before the the like bc or ac or like you know before crossfit like before i started learning all this stuff or after and it's like the more you know it can like mess with you a little bit because you like you know that one cookie or something like that is not a big deal but like you also know that like too much sugar and so it it can have that effect on people totally but i do think i mean because i get that a lot of times too where it's people are like oh my gosh like why would anybody ever want to eat like this? Like you have, cause I, you know me, like mm-hmm. I remember you sent me a text a couple of years ago cause I did the week of eating and you were like, I thought I, I was know. consistent. I'm like the wild west. Compared <laughs> <to you. laughs> but I just basically eat the same th- and it's actually yeah. not that way that much right now, but like exactly the same. And I'm not talking like, it's like just the same meal because you know when, when you're busy, your iced coffee, you know, exactly. the hour of the day. <laughs> it's just more of like a routine thing. And just cause I don't, I don't have the brain the bandwidth to think about it is more than anything. But when other people see it, they think they see neuroses. Totally. And I think that those two things um, are the, like the water's muddy sometimes. It's like, no, no, I'm just like, I enjoy feeling a certain way Mm -hmm. and I'm lazy with coming up with stuff. And so, I mean, you're kind of the, like, you don't even, you're, you're the food person who doesn't really cook. (laughs) Exactly. I'm the nutritionist who hates to cook. And so you end up just eating the same, like similar stuff over and over. Yeah. Deli, turkey, you know, cooked chicken sausage, but cold, like apple done. Call it a day. (laughs) (laughs) I used to eat um, for dinner before, because Julian cooks a lot and his mom is a really good cook. I used to eat deli, turkey, like um, and cheese and like grapes Love for it. like dinner Love it. Oh, I know. <laughs> when I was actively competing. Yeah, well, I might have been a little low on cows, but I love the simplicity. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we know that it can be so simple. And I think we learned a lot of that with the traveling. Totally. Yeah. Um, okay. So you traveled and you worked for CrossFit, uh, through what, like 2017, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then is that when you started Optimize 
Pretty Me? much. Yeah. Okay. So I resigned mid 2017 as I was finishing my master's then in nutrition. Um, and so I needed that year to finish it out. And so technically 2018 is when it, you know, was formalized as a company and all that stuff. Yeah. And the 800 gram challenge is when I launched publicly in 2018, January. Yeah. Awesome. So it's all, I mean, it's five years. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. So many grams. <laughs> it's a lot of grams. <laughs> Have you ever done the math, the grams? Of the grams consumed? <laughs> I don't know. I should. It's. Uh, I did one year of tracking how many days I'm consistent out of a year, and I'm like 92% consistent mm. on that. So it is a lot of grams. It's a lot of. A lot of that's produce. a lot of bananas. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, okay. So would you say that because you were you were off on these like paths that yeah. were maybe over the top or unnecessary or mm. very strict or whatever? How, did you have like one? come to Jesus for lack of a better term, like where, like, what am I doing? Like, this is yeah. all so unnecessary or was it gradual yeah. to where you can, cause what you eat now and what you suggest now and the reason that why we want to collaborate you, with you is because it does just bring it back to some very basic things like mm-hmm. the bottom, you know, part of the pillar just being like, be consistent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how did you get back to yeah. that? How did I go from crazy to normal? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was probably actually towards the end of my CrossFit, you know, time and realizing what are the principles that people don't understand about nutrition um, that would help them answer their own questions. And that's actually where a lot of uh, the seminar staff helped me with nutrition was answering questions and Mm -hmm. learning like how to better answer questions. And some of them with nutrition would be like, okay, what does this person not understand? Mm -hmm. And it was understanding that, oh, wow, there's this is why we have so many diets out there. They don't actually work in that many different ways. Mm. There's some common reasons why they work. So I started putting together the pieces then, especially with the ideas of quality and quantity, which they definitely preached as well, and understanding, okay, how did the zone, which was still the diet of the day there, um, how did the zone answer quality and quantity, and sort of seeing the trends then with the other stuff. So I started to piece together for sure at CrossFit. Um, And then I was still there when I was also doing my master's, so that also helped lay that on top of that. And definitely had the idea for the principles of nutrition as I was finishing up there, for sure. Yeah, it's like this is, needs to be the underlying groundwork to help people understand nutrition before then picking fasting or paleo. Because I don't really care if people pick those specific right. diets, but understanding that. Why it works. Right. You're not necessarily going to see any transformational result from them if you don't understand why it could work. It was exactly my experience. You know, I did umpteen different diets and was kind of the same maybe a little more neurotic, and that was it. And so I didn't really understand the principles. So yeah, it started to come together towards the end of my CrossFit tenure, for sure. We had a conversation recently, like a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> about there was like a very nuanced post that we were talking about where it was like they switched like a couple words around, and we were just like, what? I mean, but and now people are going to get wrapped around that axle where it's like it's not really – most people are so far from that. Yeah. Most people are so far from worrying about nightshades mm, yeah. and then they'll read one post about or hear a Huberman podcast right, right, about right. nightshades or whatever. And I think all that information is right. super right. cool. Right. Yep. I, I love getting into it. But, and we feel the same way about fitness where they're like, well, what percentage of my one rep max should these thrusters be? And it's like, right. I'm sorry, sir, but you haven't worked out right. regularly right. for four years. We're like, gonna- let's worry. <laughs> let, don't worry about it. Just pick something and go totally. for it, you know? And I think that's exactly how you speak about um, nutrition. I honestly don't know how you do it. The reason that Molly runs nutrition for us is because when we started, people started asking for a nutrition challenge. Sure. And I had done enough seminars and given the nutrition <laughs> lecture enough times and, you know, I tried to help people with nutrition that I was like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do, I can't it, yeah. do it. Like the questions and the, um, the like connection that people have emotionally to what Correct. they eat and what they think it should be. Like, how do you navigate that? Because mm-hmm. I mean, you do a really good job of being very straight to the point and very level headed mm-hmm. and not allowing it to become an emotional thing. Like, yeah. Hey, this is, you know, what I have found, but do whatever you want kind of mm-hmm. thing. I mean, the same way that we talk about fitness, yes. it's like, yeah, sure. You want to use a sandbag for this part and dumbbells for that part. And instead of do three rounds, do five, like whatever, like, yeah. okay, here's our suggestion, but do sure. what you're going to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's recognizing that lots of different diets can and do work. Right. It's, it's not that people can't be vegan or that they can't be paleo or whatever. Like it's, it's just first recognizing that we have lots of people on successful, many different diets. Mm-hmm. Like there isn't one out there. And as much as I love the 800 gram challenge, lots of people were successful with nutrition before it. So it's right. like, I have to reconcile the fact that 
barrel. Or if they did 700 grams right. or 900 grams, right. it would it could still work. Could still work. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe people, I don't know, whatever, on macro. So I have to just come to terms myself as somebody in the nutrition space that while I like my ideas, there are plenty of other people who are successful not with my ideas. And right. how am I going to do that? But the principles are the same. I think like we've talked about the 800 gram challenge versus the templates, for example. Yes. And we actually, because I, you know, look up to you so much and I value that, pro what you've created with 800 grams, I was like, do we get 800 grams on the template? So we went through and, yeah. and did the math and it's like, you're saying it, it they're all, be, they're all be, the yeah. same. It, it, if you're getting results, yes. it's, it's matching the principles. The underlying principles for yeah. sure. And to be honest, I like to point out that some of the principal groundwork actually was very influenced by CrossFit. So as you know, CrossFit is not doing Fran on Monday and five by five back squats on Tuesday. It's constantly varied functional movements at high intensity. Right. And so it was sort of coming to be with nutrition. It's like, okay, what are the underlying ideas that we have to adhere to? Okay, calories are a thing. They matter. Oh, it turns out how you divide up those calories and macronutrients that matter. Oh, wait, we also need vitamin A. Oh, wait, we also have to talk about sustainability. Yeah. So it ultimately was like, okay, those are the endpoints. And maybe you get it with the templates and maybe you get it with the 800 gram challenge and maybe you get it with the vegan diet. Okay, but this is what we have to get in line. And so so I think that is what helps um, talk to different people in nutrition is just sort of disarming them. It's like, I'm not trying to convince you to do my thing. Right. I'm trying to convince Here's you that like tool. calories, yeah. calories are a thing and vitamin A is a thing. Do you believe? Okay, great. If you believe. <laughs> you sound like, you sound like the people that knock on your door. Right. You see, do we need to go door to door with this? Totally. If you can believe <laughs> these radical ideas like sustainable, sustainability matters and like vitamin A is an essential nutrient, then we can talk nutrition. Okay. Right. And how you want to go and apply that, then, then we're going to have some, you know, difference of opinion and that's fine. Um, okay, so I actually wanted to talk, since we've already mentioned it several times, people are like, what are these principles? So let me just, we can, obviously we're not going to dive into all of them, sure. but I have them pulled up um, because I do think that, I love that you've put these, how, when did you develop these? Like what year or whatever? Was this right from the get-go in 2018 or... Was, pretty, did this come later? Pretty much. I had been, again, kind of thinking about a principle-driven approach to nutrition. Um, and I did like a talk, I think at the end of that year, that was quality and quantity. And then I was just sort of, again, thinking about all the different questions people ask and what don't they understand. And it ended up coming up to ten, out of 10. So I think it was probably mid-2018 or early 2019 when I like codified it as 10 principles of nutrition. Did you ever have more than 10 or did you feel like it had, it had to, to be, be like a nice round number um, or less than 10 and you threw an extra I one in there? just to get <laughs> yes. to 10. I have to admit there was something nice about 10. Like the 10 commandments type yeah, thing? Like yeah. the 10 principles? There was, but it, so far it's worked out that I actually had 10 things to say. I probably could be talked into one or two maybe going away, but... So far, I haven't really felt the need to change them. And what I like about um, these is you talk about them that um, they're not in order. No. Because people see a number next to it, and they're like, well, this one's the most important, and then this one, and by the time you get to 10, it's like, take it or leave it. But right. um, one of my favorite things that you'll say is it's never just one thing, yeah. um, which many one-liner posts or podcasts that you'll listen to or even you know some plans, they zone in on the one thing What's and maybe one it's thing? one principle in What's here that they'll thing, zone right? in on and people be think that it's all about that one thing now whether it's timing yeah. or eliminating one entire macronutrient or food group or whatever it is they zone in on the one thing totally and you'll say that it's never just one thing that's principle five if they ask for the most important one thing principle i'm gonna say it's, it's the principle <laughs> oh it is on here it's, oh yeah, yeah okay totally. it's number five <laughs> okay so um We'll talk through a couple of them without diving into it too deep sure. because you have po you have many resources for this already um, that people can go and check out. Um, but the first one, not the most important Correct. one, just the first one yeah. that's on the list. Do you ever change the order just to mess people up? No. You should. Part of the thing is I put them in that order more from a teaching perspective okay. than one of importance. Like I felt like this worked in the flow of like how you have to understand nutrition, not that this was the most important. Actually, before I um, read these, what would you say if you could yeah. choose one thing is the biggest mistake that people make when trying to make changes in their nutrition? Yeah. Let's say with a general goal of weight loss, because that's sure. like the most common Popular. one. Yeah, they just overcomplicate it. You know, it's like I'm going to combine low fasting with locally sourced only, you know, ingredients, and I'm also going to do it on low carb on Sundays, and I'm going to cycle it with another diet on Thursdays, and you're just like, really? <laughs> like, I just, 
I just don't think we need all of that. And I'm sure you see that with fitness too, right? Like I just don't need all of these different things. I can just show up for 10, 20 minutes a day and get really fit. Yeah. I mean, we tell people obviously like with our programming, like we program in, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there's like a, you know, there's a rhyme and reason to it. But honestly, like do Saturday on Tuesday, Monday on Friday, like you're not like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And tell you're like looking to optimize because you've been so consistent for so long that you need to worry about that. But like people get so panicky if they do them out of order or like what accessory to put with them and everything. And we're just trying to educate people that it's not as important as... Consistency? They, they, yes. <laughs> just do something and go the magic, do, and do it the, the, be, the best that you can. Totally. Okay. So the first principle that you have listed is the quantity of food you eat in calories determines your weight. Mm, that's a controversial one. I like the in calories. Mm-hmm. Um, why did you have to add the in calories? What's the biggest mis- like thing that people don't understand with that one? Yeah. Well, the second one, we talk about macronutrients, the second principle. Okay. So those are, that's actually something I do think is not understood in nutrition is how are we defining the word quantity Mm -hmm. and the way that you would define that is in calories or macronutrients yet many times people think about quantity and how full they feel oh yeah you know what Julian used to um when they had their meal prep company at first um they didn't do uh, macros or anything that came uh when I had suggested like hey you guys should actually put like protein carbs and fat on the bowls and stuff and offer that for people but they would weigh it like how much does it actually weigh? Yeah, because that, that does indicate uh, like the filling nature of the bowl or mm-hmm. the meal they're about to eat. And that's a fact. In fact, the magic of the 800 gram challenge mm-hmm. is <clears throat> it weighs a lot. But what happens a lot is when people eat processed foods that are so common and they're just bites here and there, mm-hmm. a handful of chips, you don't feel that full. So how possibly could I be gaining weight or mm-hmm. why is weight loss so hard? And it's like, because fullness does not describe the number of calories you ate. And mm-hmm. so that's why defining quantity, especially in the first two principles, it's like we're talking about quantity in terms of the calories you ate. And then the second one, we're talking about quantity in terms of macronutrients. So I had to spell that out. Yeah. There's a lot out there these days about um, people with calories don't matter. Mm. Like, uh, it's not about calories at all. It's just about um, macronutrients or th- yep. it's not calories. It's, uh, you know, whether it has certain types of seed oil, like whatever, like these yeah, seed oils or whatever. Yeah. Um, calories do matter. Yeah, they're a thing. <laughs> they're a thing. It would make my job a lot easier if they weren't a thing, but they're a thing. I, I think some of that with the confusion with the macronutrients is... They both matter, but they're not synonymous. So when people take this idea, oh, it's all about macronutrients, it's like, okay, hold on, we're gonna get to principle two in a second. I'm gonna talk about why we have to worry about if the calories are all coming from carbs or how we we look at them. For sure, they do matter in the sense that they're not one for one, but every macronutrient has a caloric value. And anybody who's gonna direct a body composition change or a weight change, you're gonna see a change in the total number of calories. So it's really hard to kind of combat people who say that. It's just like a really, lack of understanding and also the other thing that people think is like oh well will you say calories matter well then i guess i can eat a twinkie that's the same number of calories as spinach you're like no no no. there's other concepts we're going to get to them in later principles we're just saying that the caloric value is a thing in combination with these other concepts (laughs) i gave that lecture so much i remember there was like an example breakfast that we used to give that was like 50 grams of of carbs so we'll get into the macronutrients i guess so so um principle number two is the quantity of food you eat in macronutrients determines your body composition. Yeah. So one of the things, that, the example that I used to give 150 times that I gave that lecture was to get the 50 grams of uh, carbohydrates, you would need to eat 32 cups of spinach, I think right. was the thing. And, it, and still there's like a lot of factors with fiber and right, all this yeah. stuff that it, that's different. But to get people to understand and wh- why the 800 gram challenge is so great is it's just going to be really hard to match the calories in processed food with... Totally. Um, especially veggies, like (laughs) good luck with the veggies. Um, One of the things that I've said before, and tell me um, if you agree with this or maybe I need to change my tune, is that your calories, calories in versus calories out will determine your weight, Mm. but the macronutrient and how it's broken up will be more a determinant of your um, body composition, like how that weight is distributed. So you could be 150 pounds at 30% body fat. You can be 150 pounds at 10% body fat. You're 150 pounds each way. Mm -hmm how it's distributed the macronutrient is and obviously your activity yeah. and all that stuff play a huge role in that totally and that's the whole point of principle too it's like yeah weight is not the same thing as body comp and so how do we control that through nutrition as you mentioned yeah we got to look at the macro breakdown of that um of course training's going to help but yeah that's how we can do it from a nutrition perspective and it really comes down to making sure protein's high enough 
What do you say, and I guess this is probably going to get into some of the other principles. You'll tell me which number it is. I'm sure when I ask this question, but when, because uh, one of the popular ways to eat out there is, is doing macros. And I think this is still popular now because I've seen it, but having your carbohydrates and fats coming from mostly ice cream or mm. protein bars or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Versus more real food yeah. and what they're saying is like well i'm hitting the macronutrients Macros, and yeah. i'm hitting the calories so this is uh, why would i change it why would i be eating broccoli and spinach and all of that stuff yeah yeah i mean i do mention that in principle four that's the quality of your food great in terms of micronutrients determines your health now technically there is some more nuance in these principles which of course we don't have time to cover but let's just say that that yeah like they're leaving some room on the table because their foods do not have a high nutrient density, especially in terms of vitamins, minerals, fiber, and then potentially these phytochemicals. Um, and so that's what I actually find with a lot of my clients is a lot of people who come in, they have done macros a lot or, or pick your diet of choice and they still don't find it sustainable. And when you hit mm -hmm. your macros on these processed foods, you often are not really full. You often mm -hmm. are quite hungry because you get, you know, a donut or some <laughs> small <laughs> processed food. Yeah. And you're like, why can't I make it to dinner? I have to have this other snack. And it's because you're not filling up on those whole unprocessed foods. So that's kind of the problem I see all the time with these, oh, it hits my macros approaches is it's really just also still not sustainable. You know, I, one of the things that I think is the best to come out of like the pandemic and everything, I do feel that people now more than ever are worried more about their health. Mm. Um, maybe not more, but the, yeah, more. They're, they're not necessarily worried more about their health than their body composition, but they are thinking about their health mm. more than they were before. Yeah. Because I feel like, you know, for the time that I've worked in um, fitness, the majority of people come and they only care about like, how am I going to look? What, mm -hmm. how am I going to lose weight? Blah, blah, blah. And then maybe as they start to get older, they finally start thinking about their health. I feel yeah. that people are more conscious of that and are looking for that stuff now, yeah. which makes our job a little bit easier <clears throat> aside from them going down weird rabbit holes now <laughs> that they wouldn't have necessarily gone down before. But you know, the, some of the stuff that we talk about in nutrition is how is it going to impact your body composition, but also how is it going to impact your health? Yeah. You can have a great looking body composition and still have some huge holes in like what you're saying, like mm -hmm. vitamins and minerals and deficiencies, which ultimately you don't feel as good. Right. So you're not able to train as hard, which impacts all of it. Right. Totally. So there's, there's, there's more to it than just your body composition as I guess yeah. what I'm trying to say. Hopefully your goals are a little bit deeper than that. Yeah. At some point, maybe you don't come into it, but eventually, hopefully you get there. Yeah. And just quality of life. I mean, obviously health is included in that, but I, I do actually push back a lot of my clients when they're worried that the scale isn't changing and all of that stuff, especially in the early days. And it's like, okay, what number on the scale is mm -hmm. really going to bring the happiness or change your life in a significant way? And I'm not trying to put down weight goals because those can be valid and, and also do change your life. But it's, we become so fixated on this like number representing something to us, even a body fat percentage mm -hmm. that we can't see is my life going to be any better? Do I have the ability to play with my kids more or take the trip somewhere or something like that? When that's really what we need to stay focused on versus these kind of aesthetic measurements. Yeah. Okay. So principle number three then is timing only matters to the extent that it affects quantity. Timing is a big question that um, we definitely see a lot. Like how soon before I work out, should I have carbs or what, you know, what kind of carbs? And then right afterwards, is it protein and carbs or is it just protein or is it just carbs? Or <laughs> like, can I eat? Pa I feel like the Oprah, yeah. like back in the eighties or nineties said, don't eat past 6 PM. And people are still to this day, like latched onto, you should never, ever eat at night. Or you should fast for the first six hours that you're awake to like optimize this and that. Like there's so much stuff around timing. I know. And you don't have to worry about it. If <laughs> just forget it, forget it. If the quantity is right each day, but that's why I phrased it as timing only matters to the extent it affects quantity. Because like, let's say this is a classic example that somebody decides to add a post-workout protein shake. Mm -hmm. Obviously their total quantity that day is going to be higher. So sometimes people will add the post-workout shake and be like, I'm recovering better and I feel better. And it's like, you could add that shake anywhere in the day and have the same mm. effect. You just needed more total protein. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit fixated on the timing when in reality, the results are coming from more total quantity. And so that's what I'm trying to help people understand. You don't have to be so rigid in these prescriptions that everything needs to be perfectly spaced out. Instead, look across the day, did I get my total protein in? Now, from a logistics standpoint, like 
you're not going to want to try to eat the 120 grams of protein at dinner. Most of us are going to spread it out during or the right day. before you work out. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we end up having these certain times in the day that we eat, but collectively the big picture of what was the total across the day is what you want to stay focused on. And that's what the literature shows, especially on protein timing, that once protein is equal, it, it doesn't really matter when you have it. Would you say, obviously one of the things that we battle with a lot when it comes to fitness is people using professional athletes mm. as their, well, if so-and-so is doing this, yeah. uh, then I should do this. Yeah. Um, nutrition timing especially, and maybe quality too, to be honest, a yeah. little bit, um, I would say also can make the regular everyday, I'm just trying to be fit person, think that they need to be doing all sorts of weird stuff with their timing because they're looking at what, wh whoever, Matt Frazier or Rich Froning, like how they're timing their carbs in the middle of, the CrossFit games. They're right. like, well, I need to have it, you know, in this window. And it's like, no, 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 that's because it's a three hour two event. hours later, they're <laughs> about to do later, something right. else. You know what I mean? And then two hours after that, they're going to do something else. Yeah. Um, do you have to battle those questions a lot? A little bit. I mean, for sure, people look up to those athletes. And I think one of the things I've said that I really uh, would like to repeat, it's something along the lines of like, if you're going to mirror a top athlete, Mirror them in terms of their work ethic, not mm -hmm. their nutrition Yeah, protocol. I've heard you say that. <laughs> because what they do is absolutely amazing, but their nutrition is not going to be appropriate for 99% of people. Here's the thing, too. I think there's a lot of protocols that they follow that aren't necessary, but it's what works for them mentally. Like some of it, mm -hmm. being a top athlete, is just believing in what you're doing is the thing to do. And so if you really believe that this is your lucky food or this is what, mm -hmm. you know, you really like after a workout or whatever, it's best to do it from the mental sanity point of view. But that is not grounds to then repeat that. It's really true with supplements. If you really believe you're going to have a response from a supplement, you will. And so some of these top athletes, I don't think, need to do some certain things. But who am I to say? It's like it's Michael all, Jordan had to have a right. brand new pair of shoes and he had to lace them himself and everything like that. You it's hear these stories. Stuff. It's all of that stuff. And so they have a lot of practices that the science does not show is necessary. But I'm also I'm like, hey, do you because you're at a level where you have to you have to play that mental game. I think, too, I mean, as somebody with experience, on that side that they do tie back to the principles now like as we're sitting here talking like so for example when I started training with um the NorCal crew with Jason and Neil and those guys I remember Neil was just like you need to you need to eat pizza twice a week <laughs> and so I was like all right Neil Maddox like I'll go right. it wasn't the Papa John's pizza like that wasn't the secret sauce of all of a sudden now I'm like <clears throat> adding weight to my lifts and all of I needed more calories. food. Yeah, I, need <laughs> I needed more calories. More calories. Yeah. I needed more carbohydrates. I'm somebody that like, I'm not a big eater. Yeah. I don't eat a lot during the day. Um, and so I just needed more food. And the same is uh, now to this day for, I, I do a protein shake with like, um, I'll eat like a banana and my like whey protein with my collagen protein because I need calories. And yes. I know I'm not going to eat those. And we're so busy with our three kids and I'm breastfeeding and all this stuff. It's not the specific shake and the mix that's in there. Um, although, you know, like I appreciate the brands yes. that I like and everything right. like that, but it, the, it's just that I need the more protein, calories. The calories. Yes. And that's a really big challenge for professional athletes is fueling them enough mm -hmm. because they have these huge training blocks and you don't always feel like eating right before you're about to go do a training mm -hmm. block. So that's like, where am I going to fit in 4,000 calories in the day? Mm -hmm. Oh shoot, I better have it right now. And that's when timing becomes really important because they have to think about these specific time windows so that they can actually be properly fueled. Most of us closer to 2,000 calories, 2,500 calories, it's not really a big management problem of where am I going to figure out how to eat this today? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and plus most of us are just sitting. So it's like, I can eat and then sit and do my job, right? Yeah. So it's, for them, a lot of high level athletes, I have a feeling that they could have more calories added and would actually see a performance bump, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it made a big difference for me. Um, okay, number four, the quality of food as determined by micronutrient density determines your health, which we already kind of yeah. talked about where it's like, yeah, you can eat Twinkies and beef jerky and hit your macros, but um, it's maybe not the most healthy in terms of micronutrients and also like you're saying like, Good luck with sustainability after right. a few days of that because you're going to be hungry. Hungry. Yeah, for sure. Um, number five you had mentioned before is it's never one thing. Mm. And you can see us like already like weaving in and out of, you know, when when we're talking about one principle, it's hard not to like let it bleed into one of the other ones. Yeah. People are like, should I only focus on calories or macros or should I only focus on this type of protein? Would you ever yeah. tell people to focus on one thing at a time, though? Of course. Like yeah. pick one. Yeah. Pick calories or pick macronutrients or pick quality. 
Yeah, in my diet progression, I typically do something like the 800 gram challenge first. So we're focusing on fruits and veggies. This right. is like my three pillars method. The second is to add the protein and then the third is to focus on total calories. So I certainly understand from an application point of view that we don't want to be like, I am doing all 10 principles perfectly now. Right, right, right. <laughs> this is to understand the groundwork to then think, okay, how am I going to put these ideas into practice? So yeah, and w when we go into practice, we typically do one of a, one thing at a time, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, number six is all diets control quantity to varying levels of precision. Yeah. And I think this is a great like segue to what we're going to have with the street parking nutrition stuff, um, where we'll have the very simple like palm method or balanced plate where we're encouraging balance across the macronutrients. It kind of controls calories yep. because we're looking at, you know, making sure there's some veggies on your plate and making sure there's protein and all this. It's not super precise yep. all the way through the 800 gram challenge and lazy macros, which yep. are both yours to the template where you're mm -hmm. like weighing and measuring everything. And all the goals for all of them are the same, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's like, how precise do you want to be? Mm -hmm. We encourage people obviously to start with the least precise one and just yep find consistency in that but is that basically like what you're saying there is like you can go down to the I'm I, I we had I'm not even gonna say who it was but one of the people that we trained with at NorCal he would um weigh his protein powder wow on a food scale wow <laughs> like that's some yeah. precision right that like when he was doing macros and sure. it was crazy um versus oh well, whatever I lost my scoop like this kind of looks right and it's yeah. so that's a lot of it. A lot of it is just trying to put together why there's such variable results for different diets. Mm -hmm. And when you see people who go on paleo, some really lean out, other people don't change their weight. Like, why is that? Aren't mm. they both following the same rules? And it's because the rules of paleo don't specify calories or macronutrients. And so how that person interprets the rules then dictates their calories and mm. macronutrients and then can affect their weight. Um, versus something like macros where you're weighing and measuring everything, it's quite precise. And so when people actually adhere to it, they are going to see very, you know, precise weight changes on their body. And so it's kind of, okay, in fasting, why do some people lean out and other people don't? Well, the total amount of food is not specified. What's so, happening when you're actually eating? Yeah, what's happening when you're actually eating and trying to give people the idea. That's what most diets are trying to do because weight is the number one goal that everybody has is trying to control weight. And sometimes they make you measure everything, which would do it the most directly. And sometimes they just give you a bunch of rules to follow which you tend to have more bearable results. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I like that because it's like, uh, like you're saying, I, I really like the 800 gram challenge because it's not taking things out. Right. It's just, let me fill you up on this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you're, it's controlling, and you can correct me if I'm explaining this yeah. incorrectly. Um, you're controlling quantity by filling the person up with foods that maybe are less calorically dense. Totally. And so they're less likely to overeat on the other stuff. Totally. Um, and so that's how you're controlling versus macros where you're measuring every single thing. And you, so you're gonna know way more precisely, but both of them are controlling calories with they different could. tools. I mean, that's the wild card of the 800 gram challenge. I love it. Most people end up eating less calories, but it is possible to gain weight on the 800 gram challenge simply because if you eat your 800 grams and then you decide, well, I deserve the pint of ice cream because I finished my fruits and veggies for the day, we might not lose weight. And so the 800 gram challenge- Or if you're like dipping your yeah. <laughs> um, apple slices right. in like Into a tablespoon cream. of peanut butter every single time. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't guarantee. And this is why not everybody loses weight on the 800 gram challenge. Um, it does not precisely control total calories or uh, macronutrients. Now, as we're gonna get to principle seven, we also have this pesky thing called sustainability. Mm. Weighing and measuring everything, a lot of people don't wanna do it. And so this is why we have so many different diets out there. They're basically trying to have you count calories without counting them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So number seven, which is what the number we were on anyway, sustainability is the most important factor in diet selection. I agree with you 100%, both with nutrition and with your yes. fitness program, obviously. Um, and we've talked about this with our nutrition stuff a lot. I've said, I've made plenty of posts where it's like, okay, you're going to do this cleanse or you're going to do this fasting thing or you're going to do whatever okay then what then like what? after this 12 week program or after this 30 day you know strict no sugar thing or whatever then what's your plan and almost always the, there was never like a a thought about right. a yeah. then what most diets don't intend for you to do them forever mm -hmm. and there's no real instruction on the yes. then what and so for us i always say like only add something in or take something out if you can picture yourself doing it forever. forever and at the pace so if i'm somebody who eats maybe like fast food for all three meals mm -hmm. um i could never picture eating the way that the way i actually miranda eat in real life 
but it's not that I couldn't get there, but I don't want to do it all at once. Correct. Right. <laughs> so talk about that a little bit. Totally. Like, you know, if you're not going to do it, we can't worry about that as an idea. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone's always worried about which optimal. one is the best, right? Which one's the best? And it's like, well, what are you going to do? That's where we actually have momentum. That's what we have to be yeah. concerned about. And like everybody wants these long-term results. Nobody wants 30 day results. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, to get the results, you need to continue to do the thing that got you there. And so yeah, I love your thing. It's like, can you see yourself doing this forever? I, I, you know, can you see yourself doing this next year? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great kind of screen of like, is this really something that I'm going to do? Uh, I do like to bring up with this one because I say it's the most important factor for diet selection. There always is going to be a little bit of a tug that like if you want to change where you are right now, sustainability isn't meant to be easy. It's, it's what's the most sustainable change. There's going to be some friction. There's going to be mm -hmm. something difficult about it. Otherwise, we're not going to get a different result. But it's, again, not trying to jump to perfect. It's like what's the one step closer to where I want to be? What would you say? Because one of the things that we get a lot is people like a jump start. So they like to do something drastic because it gets them out of their bad habits and then they feel like they can make a more sustainable plan right. after the jump start. Yeah. Do you hear that a lot? Yeah, I'm, I sort of see them as a waste of time. You could be just practicing the habits that you know you need forever. Um, but with nutrition, I'm not super into convincing, you know, if somebody mm -hmm. really wants to do the 10 day cleanse, it's like, well, I'll see you in 10 days when you realize you're not going to continue it. Or even mm -hmm. on day five, when you realize it was a silly idea and then mm -hmm. we'll start then. Because sometimes when we're so fixated on an idea, like get it out of your system. It's kind of like what you're saying <laughs> with the athletes. Like if you feel, if that's going to mentally right. feel you feel like you're what more well prepared to then go do the right. sustainable thing thankfully the body is resilient so it's <laughs> like i'll see you in 10 days you know let me know and yeah. then we'll get started but i do sort of see them as just a waste of time like these are not the habits that you're going to do forever so why don't we work on the habits you are yeah start doing what you're actually going to be doing yes it's, okay yeah don't waste 10 days right number eight the universal diet problem is processed foods mm. This is one I've seen a lot lately. I feel like just even within the last few months where people are um, arguing a lot about what's processed because oh. everything's processed. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you mean when you say that? I mean the foods that you can't create in your own kitchen, like Flaming Hot Cheetos. Or <laughs> <laughs> You don't have the recipe for Flaming Hot Cheetos? Yeah. Or these, any of these processed foods that are just like, how do you come up with this? And the ingredients are things you don't have. You know, the, not that additives are necessarily unhealthy, but they're just not something you can put together in just a regular kitchen. There are people who get really dogmatic about the word, and they're like, oh, well, when you blend spinach, it's processed. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Nutri nutrition quality is pretty much the same. Yeah, like, I yeah. wouldn't worry about that. It's really when we get to these very high calorically dense items that are common everywhere. And anywhere you check out, anywhere you go, they're everywhere. And sometimes this, they've been called in the literature ultra-processed food to distinguish this idea I've of like that, yeah. industrial-level processing, which I, I think can help. Um, but yeah, it's the most common problem. There's nobody I work with who's eating too many fruits. <laughs> like zero and people worry about that they're worried about right too people much sugar are very or, worried about fruits these days yeah <laughs> and it's just it's never that issue and a lot of people come in and they they are eating a good amount of whole unprocessed foods relative to a standard american diet but they still don't see how the veggie straws and the paleo cocoa brownie and the almond butter really do add up to overall too much calories in their diet or whatever. You mentioned the paleo cocoa brownie. Okay, mm. so <laughs> this might be off topic for a second. That's okay. I can make a paleo cocoa brownie <laughs> in my kitchen. Wow. Um, I mean, I, th I think, you know, oh, one of the things yeah, that I yeah, used yeah. to like say at seminars yeah. a lot of times was like, the fastest way to have all of your members gain 10 pounds is to start passing out paleo cookbooks. Yes. Um, because <laughs> totally. then people are bringing in the paleo brownies and the paleo cookies and the paleo banana bread mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And they think that um, this is where calories matter. Yes. And you can have high quality, yes. quote unquote, quality foods that are foods I can make in my own kitchen. But the control, calories yeah, get out of control matter. because you're with the amount of coconut oil in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's super common. I, in fact, you know, one of the things that for some reason I kept getting on, on Facebook, probably I'm targeted for nutrition. It's like all these keto recipes and mm, the ones, my gosh. and you see this on They're everything. So on social calorically media. dense. Yeah. On, on anything on social media, the things that gets the likes are like the protein brownie or like, you know, the keto cookies or pick your processed food that we all like, the snacks, the desserts, and then somehow use paleo ingredients or low carb ingredients. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the most popular thing because that's what people want to eat. And it comes back to principle eight. There are universal diet problem. You can't throw paleo or keto in front of it and remove the fact that calories matter. Yeah, so, I think that's really good because I think one of the suggestions that I make to people um, is if you're going to eat it, just eat it. Like don't try to make it healthy. Totally. 
Like we eat, when we eat pizza, we eat pizza, regular yeah. pizza, um, yeah. you know, tasty pizza from a pizza place. Um, when we eat cookies, like we go get the actual, Cookie, right. I think what the trap that people fall into a lot of times is they think that just making it with better ingredients somehow changes the, the calories, like you're saying, or the impact. And it might have, um, some better vitamins and minerals right. in it, I guess, right. or the, the fats are a little healthier or whatever, but like the calories are still there. And so for me, it's like, you shouldn't need that stuff every single day. It, but when you are going to have it, enjoy, just eat totally. the regular stuff. Enjoy it. Yeah. And if you're really thinking that like your paleo brownie is what's going to get you the magnesium on your day, like, <laughs> I'm going to guess that your diet's off overall. Like that what we, when we look at these items that are marketed as healthy and they actually show some of the micronutrients, they're often not any better, sometimes worse on certain ones mm -hmm. compared to just the conventional chip or whatever it is. And so there's always this idea like, oh, I'm getting more vitamins and minerals. And it's like, if you're holding out for your serving size of <laughs> chips for your micros, I can assure you the diet's not on point. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. So ultra processed, um, you're looking at stuff that's in a package. It can sit on a shelf forever. It's yep. That kind of stuff. Yeah, and again, and that you to you for you, that's the biggest problem that we have. Oh yeah, it's everywhere. I mean, once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Like, go to the bank. Why? I went to I the gas station right? today, and I went inside, which I don't often do, and it was wild to me. It's crazy. I mean, think about it too. Like gas station, you would think you're buying gas. Most of the time, you stop there for like snacks or drinks or whatever. Not you, but you know what I mean. Drugstore. Mm -hmm. Those have more crap in them than actual like healthy foods. You go to any of these like home bedding stores and it's like mm -hmm. for some reason they just have all these snacks lining yeah, like the what aisle I, what does Go that have to bank. do with the, yeah the banks now have like the coffee machines with the latte they do. whatever and they have the bowl of candy it's like crazy I, go to your office there's very few offices where you can't have some type of snack vending machines everywhere you look an airplane the flight's less than an hour and they're worried about your snack they you know? offer you <laughs> snacks like three times <laughs> it's constant it's everywhere and this is where it's like when people you know, we'll loop this into the fruit thing. It's like, well, where's the fruit if it's so much of a problem? I'd love mm -hmm. to know where it is. You know, even, you know, when you leave the grocery store, it's always lined with the candy bars and the popcorn mm -hmm. and the whatever. Go to Best Buy, try to buy a TV. You're going to get the craft bars. store is, the craft is one store. that I go to a lot. It's sports like, why do we stores. need cook candies at the craft store? It, well, same thing. It was sports stores where you can go and get like, you know, new shoes, cleats for your kids or whatever. It's like wall of candy. And they know your kids are going to be with you too. So it's that's a whole everywhere. separate topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It's everywhere. And it, really is you know if whether or not it's a weight health or a fitness goal it typically is going to be ratcheting back on how much of that is in the person's diet yeah so I know that you're not like super strict on yeah. pretty much anything though and what a lot of uh nutrition experts will say is you none of it ever like they're they will terrify you to yeah. ever put a yeah. piece of sugar or pro ultra processed food in your mouth ever again or you're going to die of cancer right, right. um people will ask well what's the like how much is too much or how do I know what's appropriate and not appropriate? Like how can people start to gauge that stuff? Cause I've mm -hmm. never heard you say never ever yeah, stay no. away from it completely. No. And I believe they can be part of a healthy diet. The key is part. And mm -hmm. most of the time the part that people are having right now is too much, especially if somebody wants weight loss, I'm, I'm willing to get guess that it, it's going to come down to the volume of processed foods. Uh, simple first thing, literally just look at the serving size mm -hmm. actually eat the Me serving and measure size. the serving size and realistically think like is this really what i have when i have the ice cream or the chips it's very hard to do you know mm -hmm. a serving size of chips is 14 chips it's not a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an ounce and it's 150 calories i used to drink a lot of diet coke mm. which may or may not fall into that category because there's i mean we we don't need to get right. into the artificial sweeteners <laughs> but i'm just going to share a story of how i got off of diet coke and it was more of a journey mm -hmm. than like a cold turkey quit um, so I used to drink a lot, like even when I owned my CrossFit gym, I drank a 32 ounce diet like while I was coaching. I feel like that was a very normal in the community at that time. Um, and what, what I started doing was I got smaller size and then a smaller size. And then it was, okay, I'm only going to drink diet Coke when I eat at a restaurant mm. because it's, it was something that I enjoyed with a meal. Yeah. And so then it was only at a restaurant and then it became only when I go to the movies, yeah. um, which was back then I, we would go to the movies a lot. So it was like once a week. And then I just kind of stopped drinking it. Every once in a while on a flight, it sounded tasty or like at a restaurant or at a movie here and there. But then I don't remember ever like the day that was the last day that I had a Diet Coke. It just kind of faded, faded. away. Yep. Uh, would you encourage like that type of, a like if you're eating candy every single day, probably don't try to stop cold turkey. Maybe go yeah. and just eat the serving size yep. and then maybe choose like 
a couple days a week or a certain occasion that it's tied to that makes it actually makes a difference and you enjoy it. You're not just eating it and not even realizing you're eating it. Yeah, I think it's, you know, like everything in nutrition, there's probably a lot of different ways. I do think for people that really have a lot of this food in their um, diet, that having it around is a mm, really big not temptation. In the home. So I don't like to say cold turkey, but if you think that, you know, if you're somebody who's really into ice cream, that you can have a pint of ice cream in there and just say no most nights, it's probably not going to go well. <laughs> so I, I do think that, I don't want to say clean up the house, but pretty much try not to have that stuff sitting around because I think it's going to be too tempting. And then yes, when you go out to social events, still have it. And I think that's what people underestimate is we don't have that many true holidays. We have mm -hmm. a lot of celebrations. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody's shower. Or always. It's <laughs> always someone's birthday at the office. Yeah. There's so many of these things that I think if you even just say, well, I'm only going to have them at a social event, you're actually still going to have quite a, a couple times frequency. a week. Yeah. 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 So I do think there's something difficult about trying to ratchet it back if it's foods you have around the house because they're so tempting for people. I would say that's a, a really easy step. That's one. I know we're going to do an episode for your podcast about yeah. um, kids. Yes. That's one that we are very good with at our home, um, especially our boys love ice cream. They get ice cream once a week. They don't yet, I mean, they're young, but they don't yet know that you can actually buy ice cream to have inside your home. Yes. Um, and so they think you have to go to the ice cream place to get the ice cream. And it's this whole like event where we are like actually like, you know, have a cool family memory around it as mm -hmm. opposed to just serving up ice cream and them getting into the freezer on their own and trying to get it and, and all of that stuff. So yeah. I think the, the having it in your home thing is, is a really, really good one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Number nine, your diet can't be validated. What does that mean? <laughs> this one's probably a little bit more serious than the other ones, but the idea was like myself, anybody cannot guarantee your health. We, we know where there's some trends. Mm -hmm. We know that eating whole unprocessed foods is a good thing. We know that, you know, maintaining a healthy weight decreases risk. We know exercise is a good thing, but whether or not you can have, I don't know, two regular sodas a day, I don't know, you know, there, there's this wiggle room where we can't guarantee that this is going to be the perfect diet for the health outcome that you want. And so it was just sort of acknowledging health risk, which is something that people are generally kind of uncomfortable with and that you can do all of the things well in terms of diet and exercise and you still have risk. There's many healthy people who get cancer or some other disease and it's like, what did I do wrong? It's like nothing, everybody mm -hmm. has risk. And so it's just understanding, hey, these are the trends where we know people generally have better health outcomes, but nothing is a guarantee. Or like people will quote, oh, there's this woman who's 102 and she says she drinks whiskey and right. Diet Coke every day. Yep. So obviously it's healthy and you're just like, well. She's an outlier and there are outliers. <laughs> and so it's like, could you maybe be one of the people who's 102 and drink whiskey and smoke? You could, but we won't know until you get there. If yeah. you get there. Yeah. <laughs> but it's more yeah. likely that you're not. not. And it's more likely you're not. And so if you want to hedge your bets a little bit, this is the way to do it. And it's also not a guarantee. The other thing that I think is important, because I get this question a lot, um, or, or I guess... It comes sometimes in the form of a question. It gets comes sometimes in the form of a um, statement. Pe <laughs> people telling me that it's it's just my people want to copy exactly what yeah. I'm doing or exactly mm -hmm. what Molly's doing, like to the like brand of oatmeal that we're right. buying or whatever, because they think if I do exactly the workouts and this and that that this person's doing, then I science no. will look exactly like them. And there's no. no like you could take two people and have them do exactly the same thing there is genetic variance and, totally. all, and all of that stuff right 100 percent. not just in terms of that but also then again disease risk and mm -hmm. that often trumps uh somebody's overall risk not just necessarily their diet mm -hmm. and that's what we often forget and so i used to get a lot of questions so this one i could be talked into taking off i, I like the concept but i used to get a lot of questions of like is this okay mm -hmm. um, you know my that, diet oh, constant yeah my diet's pretty good but i have this on saturday night is this okay and this was sort of my like i, I don't know <laughs> this, is, this is the trend. You know, if right. anybody tells you I can guarantee, you know, your health outcome by doing X, it's like, no, not it. I can tell you where there's trends. I can tell you where you can hedge your bets. That's the best we can do. Yeah. Okay. And the last one is there are diminishing returns on attaining perfection. Yeah. Um, this, this is, I think, best illustrated when people really want to lean out. Mm -hmm. And maybe they want visible abs, mm -hmm. and then they realized how difficult it is to look like that if they don't have those genetics, mm -hmm. right? And so there's this idea that's like, yeah, the the closer you get to your goal, the harder it is to get there. Mm -hmm. And maybe you don't want to put in that work or effort because it's going to take exponentially more effort to get those visible abs than it is to lose your first ten pounds. 
How much time would you say that you end up, um, when you're working like one-on-one with somebody or a, or a small group, how much time is spent with um, curbing expectation mm. or <laughs> um, working through some like emotional situations versus actually these are the grams and the foods and yeah. the quantities. Yeah, there's a lot around expectations and and emotional issues and things like we mentioned, like what's really going to change in your life at this weight and trying to yes. recognize that. Because that's what a lot, as you mentioned, is tied up in nutrition. Um, and so there's there's a good amount of that for sure. Expectations is interesting. I actually mentioned to a couple of my last masterclass groups, I walked into one of my grocery stores and very common magazine, you know, lose 48 pounds in a month. 48, exactly. Yeah, 48. Not 47, month, not in, 50. In a month, though. What in do you a month. do? Cut off your leg? I mean, <laughs> and so I sometimes will get frustrated I've seen that, that people yeah. have unrealistic expectations, but yet the media shows right. them all the time. And right. so there is this sort of level. I have to do a lot of pumping the brakes of, like, that's not real, that's not sustainable. Right. I would probably say easily 50 50 on those issues that you asked. Yeah. It's a lot. It's it's the reason that I was like, (laughs) Molly, you can go ahead and do the nutrition stuff because it's, there's, there's so much of the, um, people think that getting to a certain place Mm -hmm. is all of a sudden every other issue in their life, their kids are going to sleep better and their (laughs) husband's going to mow the lawn on time (laughs) or like what, you know, they're going to all of a sudden get a raise at their job. Like their life will just be this, certain way if they can just hit 140 pounds pounds. like and it's got to be that number it's usually like a scale or a specific body composition and um I feel like I've had the benefit of knowing some extremely fit people and I can tell you personally that there's still a very wide range of um life satisfaction (laughs) (laughs) and like relationship issues and financial problems yes and even health, right? Yeah. In that group of people where all of them appear to be very lean and that ideal body that everybody's looking for. Like all the problems Follow them. aside from, <laughs> you know, yeah, they're strong enough to carry their groceries right. and, and, you know, maybe play with their kids and go do the hike that they want to do. There, there are some huge benefits to attaining like a high, high level of fitness for sure. Mm-hmm. But all of the other life problems that are just life problems that everybody has still um, are still there <laughs> in that group, maybe sometimes worse. Um, and so, I, you know, that's one of the things, too, where it's like you're not miraculously going to be a different person. Mm-hmm. You need to like, you know, that's where, you know, there's the 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 arguments of like healthy at every size or um I can't even remember the, the name of like the loving your body the way right, that it yeah. is now where you do have to like find that where mm-hmm. you're just, like you have to find happiness along the way and don't wait until you get to that point because number one it might not ever come because mm-hmm. you don't know what your outcome is going to be like you're saying it can't be validated there's mm-hmm. only one way to find out but two like you're still you mm-hmm. at that place yeah so maybe don't use nutrition craziness as a way to try to change who you are as a person like actually look into all of that totally totally and that's what I just pose back to my small groups all the time like what number is really going to change your life why do you want that number do you have a lot of emotion tied up and to be honest one of the ways people realize that is simply when they start weighing themselves every day if that's what they choose and it's like you know two pounds up two pounds down due to water weight fluctuation that can really spin them out Mm -hmm. why are you spun out like we talked about this you know what are you really looking for there so it's a lot in nutrition. For- You've probably seen people too, because I've seen this in our groups. I mean, I, I would be lying if I said that I have not been susceptible to this myself, yeah. where you're like, oh yeah, like I filmed myself doing my workout. I thought I looked great, blah, 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 my clothes. And then you weigh yourself yeah. and it's heavier than heavier. you. And you're like, wait, and all of a sudden, all of that's, everything else goes away. It's so crazy. Um, but we've all fallen into that trap before, I think. Totally. And that's why I love metrics and, you know, the, the kind of CrossFit approach of looking at, okay, what did I lift today? Or mm-hmm. how much did I run today? You know, I know the competitive aspect can get a little bit much, but it's like, okay, let's look at that outcome. Mm-hmm. Or even something with a weight. I love pushing people to do like, use a fitted pair of pants mm-hmm. or a tape measure versus mm-hmm. the scale. Cause there's some noise there that you really start spinning up and you start to lose, like, why am I really doing this? Or maybe it's a measure of, I have energy in the afternoon to go play with my kids. Like those are so much more valuable. Yes, these are related, but we want to stay focused on that bigger picture. Yeah, and I think not like you like you were saying with nutrition, maybe applying this to the metrics that you're using, don't measure with just one thing. Yes. Because your performance you can go. go up and down for many reasons that have nothing to do with 100%. You know, it could be your sleep, it could be your stress, it could be your cycle, whatever, you know. 
Um, your pants could be fitting different one day for not because you're yes. doing anything wrong with totally. anything else. So like using multiple measures and not just Percent. one thing, not just the scale or just the measurements or just the pictures or just the performance, like all of it. Totally. And as long as you're seeing a general trend, either staying where you're at or moving in the right direction, then you're f fine. And maybe not trying to measure it every single right. day. <laughs> right. Right. No, thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, all of those things. But I mean, we could talk about so many things for forever, but I just, I'm, we're super excited to do the collaboration stuff with you and to add uh, the 800 gram challenge and lazy macros yes. into the tools that we're providing for the street parking members. Because really, again, it's about finding what works for you. There's no mm -hmm. one right way. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to provide a, a host of different options where you can work your way through some of them, maybe in order, or maybe you, you know, start with the most strict one, you go template and you're like, oof, <laughs> this measuring is a lot. Like, let me bounce around to some of yeah. the goal for all of them is the same. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's the 10 principles. It's getting quality food and getting the right number of calories, um, getting the right macronutrient balance, right? And just helping you navigate that, but in different ways, because mm -hmm. people um, yeah. will find success depending on their personality and where their life is at and all of that stuff. So i um, excited for everybody to learn from you, and I'm sure we'll be chatting again on the podcast at some point. Yes. Well, thank you so much. I'm excited for the collaboration. I love the whole ethos of your community and all of the message of consistency and sustainability. So I'm looking forward to being part of the community. One final question. Uh -oh. When we were at Fitness Freedom, uh -oh. you went on a coffee bender. <laughs> <laughs> you had told me that you hadn't, you had kind of stopped drinking coffee, what, like six months? <laughs> Only like a month. Okay. Plus, okay. Yeah. But then you had three coffees in one day yeah. at Fitness Freedom. So I wanted yeah. to check in. It's yeah. been a few weeks. Yeah. How's it going? Have you gotten it back under control? I, yeah, it went back to not a lot of coffee, but it's okay. back on now. <laughs> now visiting, I've decided to bring it back. Oh, Steve. great. Yeah, so I'm going to go get a coffee after this. It's a, I mean, it's part of, we have a lot of people with young kids. It's a really big part of our culture here to drink some coffee. So I'm back in it. Then. Enjoy. Thank you. We're going to go do a team workout soon. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks.